Hello, everybody. Boy, my heart is rejoicing with great joy. I want to thank all of those that have subscribed to the YouTube page. And if you have not subscribed to this YouTube page, please hit the subscribe and like button. But guess what? On the YouTube page, we got many more to come. Hallelujah! Praise God. Is in my vein, Lord, in my vein, yes, it's in my vein, down in my vein. While the blood, while the blood, blood is running in water, down in my vein, way down in my vein. Mm -hmm. It's in my vein, yeah, it's in my vein, way down in my vein. Yeah. 
Oh uh-huh. 
gracious and heavenly Father, the creator of both heaven and earth. We thank you, Father, and we praise your holy name for your darling son. He left his home in heaven and came down here on his old sinful earth is to save us from our sins. There was no one in heaven to take on this task, nobody but your son. So through heaven, Michael was not able to do the thing that you need to be done. They tell me there was an angel named Gabriel. He could not come and do the thing that needed to be done. But after he saw your son, your only son, he sent him down here to save us from our sins. Oh, hallelujah. And when he came, he let men like you and I drag him from judgment hall to judgment hall. He let men beat him all night long. He even let men put a crown of thorn upon his forehead. And now they were pressing that thorn down on his forehead. Well, you could see the drops of blood running from his head. But yet, he said, not a mother who. Well. After they had beaten him all night long and drugged him from Judge Hall to Judge Hall, and his body was twisted so like he would rain out of rain. And when you're trying to get the water out of the rain, brought him before the people, and the people could not recognize who he was. But he did all of this just to purchase the church with his own blood. And once he purchased the church with his own blood, he opened the way for mankind everywhere to be saved. But Jesus said, only if you come unto me. Come unto me, all of you that have a labor, and I will give you rest. There's rest in Christ. There's peace in Christ. There is happiness in Christ. There is joy. Hallelujah, sweet joy. All we found in Christ. And we pray for the church. <clears throat> in the devil word, that the church is set out to do. We pray that in members of the body of Christ, we will arm ourselves with the mighty word. We will be standing on a strong foundation. Knowing that Jesus Christ is our head of our life. He's our captain. He's our Lord. He's our King. He's our all in all. And we go right in trying to tell the Latin world that Jesus died. I tell the same love from our sins. We pray for those that in the body of Christ. They're going through the hardship. Some men awake at night. Some worry about the children. Some just worry about everything in this world. But Father, we pray that when we turn to you, we know that you're going to lead us through this old world of trouble. But we know that you is this mighty evil. That when the way in the storm of life come, you will be the evil to come and rescue your children. Oh, hallelujah, we can shout and praise your holy name today. Because we know you is worthy to be praised. We pray to our brother Josh, Captain, get ready to come before us today. A young man, we pray that as he has studied your word, that he will dig deep 
deep down in your word without any addition but all to speak. Will the Bible speak and be solid? Will the Bible solid? You let all of us know what we need to do to run this Christian race. And this is our prayer in Christ Jesus. Verse everlasting glory to me. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. Blessed assurance of Jesus is mine. Oh, what a portent of glory divine.
is you have the court officer, which basically serves as the security. Now, there are other positions inside a courtroom when and if you go to court. But the main one that I would like to focus on are two. The two that I want your minds to think about are the defendant and the defense attorney. All right, the defendant and the defense attorney. So the defendant is the one being sued. You don't like to be in this position because you're being sued, all right, in a criminal matter. And the defense attorney is the one that is going to be defending the defendant to prove that this individual is not what? Guilty. So the defendant, and then you have the defense attorney. Continuing this image of the courtroom, the defendant is you. You are the defendant. You are the person that is getting sued. And the defense attorney, instead of having an actual lawyer, what you have is what you call your reputation. So instead of having an actual lawyer, your defense attorney is gonna actually be your reputation. Now going back to Job, we've heard stories about Job before and sermons about Job. What do we know about him? Well, one, we know that Job was righteous and he was upright. We know that Satan wanted him, if you were to go back and read Job chapter 1. Also, we know that Job was very wealthy. He had many possessions. We know that Job was married. He had a family or he had a legacy. Continuing on talking about Job, we see that he had friends. And he lost everything and everyone except for what? He lost everything and everyone except for his wife. Y'all catch on to that? He also had his possessions restored by God. So if I was to talk about Job in modern day times, you can basically say that Job was his high value man. How many of y'all heard the term high value before? It's kind of common among maybe uh, Gen Xers and maybe younger. But he was a high value man. If Job was alive today, I would put him in the top 5% of men. Now, why would I put him in the top 5% of men? Because he was wealthy. Because he was married. He had a legacy. A lot of people knew him and he had a good reputation. So this morning, y'all go to my next slide. This morning, I would like to talk about what is your defense and the importance of your reputation. So what is your defense and the importance of your reputation? One of the key words that we see in Job chapter 29 if you have your Bibles, you can open up there. The key word that Job mentions throughout this scripture that I just read is in verse number 12. Verse number 12, Job says his critical word in his defense, talking about his reputation. And that key word is because. Because. So you read verse number 7 through 11, he talks about his reputation, and in verse number 12, he talks about that, he mentions that one key word of why he had that reputation, which is the cause. So when it comes to us talking about our reputation, one of the first things I want to remind us is that people can and still do judge. People can and still do judge. A lot of times when you go to YouTube, TikTok, yeah, those are the main two. TikTok and YouTube, a lot of people say, but well, why are you judging? You're not supposed to judge. People can and still do judge. Judging is simply forming an opinion about something or someone. 
Remember in John chapter 7, verse number 24, Christ says, Don't judge what you see, but judge what kind of judgment? Righteous judgment. We're supposed to judge righteously. But us being human beings, we know that we do judge from what we see. So when it comes to your reputation, one of the things I want to remind us is that people do judge you off of your physical appearance. Mm. That includes your hairstyle, what you have on your body, the piercings and markings you have on your body, the shoes you wear, your personal hygiene. Also, people judge you off of the job or your profession that you have. It's funny, here in the United States, when somebody meets you, they typically ask you, if they do, they ask you, what is your name? And the next question they usually ask is what? What do you do? do? What do you do? Now, I sometimes get a little bothered by this question, but it's a genuine question because people are trying to find out like a little bit about you. But also, when I hear the question, what do you do? I secretly hear how much money you make. Because if someone tells you what they do is a profession, you can easily pull out your phone, you can Google it and look up, and you can know about how much money they make. Another way we talk about when we talk about people judging you is the way you speak and the way you carry yourself. And also, simple things like what we eat and what we like, we judge every day. Yes. If I say Krispy Kreme or Dunkin' Donuts, some of y'all gonna say Dunkin', some of y'all gonna say Krispy Kreme. If I say Nike or Adidas, who y'all going with? Adidas. Adidas, man. <laughs> Most of y'all going with Nike. Brother Lindy's lying. Most of y'all going with Nike. Okay? If I say President Trump or President Biden, one of y'all going with Adidas. Uh, now, Adidas. Now, now, what you did was, in your head, when I mentioned those analogies, you made a what? A judgment. You said, I like Krispy Kreme donuts. I like this president. I like this brand. You simply form an opinion, and that's what a judgment is. Going on to my next point. Remember in the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse number 43, Christ mentions about, excuse me, Luke chapter 6, verse number 45. Mm -hmm. Christ talks about the abundance of the heart. He mentions two kinds of men. He mentions a good man, and he mentions an evil man. So out of the two, he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth does what? Speak. The mouth speaks. There was a show I used to watch called Family Man. Everybody remember Family Matters? Uh -huh. It's very relevant to this audience. Now, if I was speaking to another audience, they might not know. Uh -huh. But this audience knows. In the movie Family Matters, you have the, the character Steve Urkel. All right? I have some flashbacks. I was called Steve Urkel back in the day. But I'll let that go. That's, that's the years ago. Oh, yeah. When Steve Urkel did something mischievous uh -huh. or he did something wrong, what was the phrase that he would often say? Did I do that? Did I do that? And the, he did do it. When the Bible talks about out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, sometimes we need to say, did I just say that? Did I just say that? There have been some times in my conversations that I have with brothers and sisters in Christ here and outside of here. I said, did I just say that? And I said, I did say that. So it came out of my heart. So the point that I'm trying to mention when it comes to out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks is that when it comes to your reputation, it starts from within. It starts from your heart, which is your mind. I know yesterday it impacted some of you all. They had the marathon, if I'm correct. I think it was the Music City Marathon. I think it was a half full and a 5K, maybe some other races involved. But the, the thing is, you have these very disciplined people that come from all over the world that came to Nashville, Tennessee to run this marathon or this half marathon. Now, do you think these people just said, oh, I just, I'm going to sign up for this race, I'm going to show up in Nashville? <coughs> no, they decided within themselves 
They look within themselves and say, am I capable of running this distance? And what kind of training do I need? The Bible talks about, Christ says, if you're building a tower, who in their right mind would it sit down and count the cost to see if they have the capability to do it? So when it comes to your reputation, you want to focus on what's, com what's coming within your heart. Because whatever is in your heart, it will come yeah. out of your mouth. Mm. My next point, continuing on talking about your reputation, is that not everyone will accept the new you. Not everyone will accept the new you. Okay. So let's say you're, you're not pleased with your reputation. You say you're going to do something about it. And when you do something about it, you know that you are going to have some haters. They're going to say things like, well, you don't hang with us no more? Or you think you're better than us? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to say, yeah, yeah, I am better than you. Or they say things like, they try to shame you and say things like, oh, because you think you're better than us, you can't spend time with us mm -hmm. anymore. Remember John chapter 1, verse number 11, John the Baptist was talking. And when he was talking, talking about Christ, one of the things he said, he said his own did not receive him. His own people did not receive him. So when you're trying to improve your life, and when you're trying to better your reputation, you have to realize that not everybody is going to be happy about your change. Not everybody is going to be supportive. Let's say you arrive to places late, and you try to go somewhere on time. People are going to look at you strange because they expect you to be what? Don't they expect you to be late. Mm -hmm. If you improve your dress or your personal hygiene, people are going to notice that because they notice you as a slob. Now you're starting to clean up your what? Your image. And people have more respect for you. When it comes to your reputation, you have to be okay with people making smart remarks, people being jealous, or people hating on the transformation that you have for yourself. Now, now, next point. When it comes to your reputation, is that the people around you have influence. The people around you have influence. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. It's one of the few scriptures I have memorized. It says, evil communications corrupt good manners. Or the New King James Version says, evil, communi evil companions corrupt good habits. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when we talk about peer pressure, we always make it about the young people. Are oh, you going to be pressured to do drugs and have sex and do all these other things? Adults are no different. Yes. Amen. Adults are no different. We still pressure each other to do either the good thing or the bad thing. You might be pressured to go out to drink with your co-workers. Well, you might be pressured to have sex with somebody that you know. You might be pressured in a way when somebody's in a car to go fast or to go slow because somebody is in your ear. You have to realize that people still have influence on your life, whether you're old or you're young. Y'all finish the same. Birds of a feather do what? Flock together. Flock together. Birds of a feather flock together. There's a saying, I listen to a lot of personal development podcasts in my free time. And one of the consistent message that I hear is, you are the top five people that you spend the most time with. Mm -hmm. Have y'all heard that before? Yes, yeah, sir. You are the top five people that you spend the most time with. Now, some of y'all thinking in your head, who do I spend the most time with? For some of us, it's like, okay, I'm not, I'm heading in the right direction. For others, we need to change the people that are around us. And we have to remember that you as an adult, you're not as strong as you think you are. So when it comes to your influence, it's funny how when a spouse has been married for a long time, this is a physical thing, they say spouses do what? You start to look like each other. When you start to hang out with a family member 
or a loved one, one of the things that you say is, oh, you talk like my cousin. You sound like my best friend because that person has some kind of influence on them. So when it comes to your reputation, there are three uh, key takeaways I want you to remember from this lesson. When we go back to Job, in Job chapter 29, verse number 12, that key word he mentioned is, it's because. Now, if you have your Bibles, let's open up and go back to the book of Job and see some things, some of the reasons why he had the outcome he had when it came to his reputation. So in verse number 7 through 11, you see how in verse number 8, how young men saw him and they ran away. In verse number 9, we have people in authority put their hands on their mouth and they did not speak. Yeah. We have the wise men in verse number 10, the nobles, they closed their mouth and they couldn't speak when he was around. And in verse number 11, I'm paraphrasing, when he spoke, people listened to him. People listened to him. Now, why did people run away from Job? Or why did these leaders be quiet, become quiet when he came around them? Or why did people listen to him when he spoke? In verse number 12, it gave us some things. It said, because he delivered the poor. Because he was the fatherless to no one that helped him. Because someone came to him with an issue and he handled the situation. Because those who lost their spouses, he made them happy and joyful. Because he put on righteousness and, his, and he was a man of justice. Because he helped those that were visually impaired. And he was a father to the poor. And for issues and situations and problems that he did not know a solution to, he did his research to find a solution to it. So number one is, though you have a specific reputation or you have a specific image, it is because of the things that you have done and the things that you continue to do. Number two is focus on your character. Now, character, reputation, and image are similar, but they're slightly different. I encourage you in your free time, I was listening to a sermon by Dr. Miles Monroe. I think most people in here are familiar with him. He's no longer here. But Dr. Miles Monroe was talking about character. And he said, if you, know, if you want to know a true character of a man or a woman, there are three things that are going to reveal his character. Number one, he said, give that man or woman power. Number two, give that man or woman money. And number three, he said, if you want to know the true character of a man or woman, give that man or woman access to sex. Power, money, sex. It's in all our movies. It's in all our rap songs. If you give a man these things, it will reveal their character. I looked at that. I was at the gym listening to that. I was over there smiling like he was dropping gems. Now, when it comes to your character, we notice that when people get in power, they often fail because they didn't have character. When people get in leadership, now Dr. Miles Moreau, he was specifically talking about leadership, they often fail, we often fail because our character is lagging. And when you give a person money, there's a stat that goes out, there's all these people that win the lottery in like a year or so, they're broke again. You know why? Because they weren't capable they didn't have the character to handle the money. And the biggest thing on the news of all these sex scandals, when someone, a man or a woman, has access to sex, it reveals their character. Job was able to have respect because of his reputation. And lastly, when it comes to the reputation, it takes time to develop. It takes time to build your reputation. It's funny how uh, there's a quote that says, it takes a lifetime to build your reputation, but how long to ruin it? Seconds to ruin it. 
Now, if you ruin it, it's not the end of the world. You still have time to get your reputation in order. But just know that if you want to be seen as a certain way, and we have a good example like Job in Job chapter 29, it's going to take time for you to build it. It takes a lifetime to build your reputation, and unfortunately, it takes seconds to ruin it. Just like I mentioned in, in Job chapter 29, verse 12, you want people to know you in a certain way because of your actions. When people say your first and last name, if they know something about you, they're going to automatically think about two to three opinions that come to their mind. If they think about John Doe, it's going to be two to three things that come in their head. If they think about Jane Doe, it's going to be two to three things that pop up in their head. My encouragement to you this morning is to work on your character, work on your image, and build your reputation. Those three things are slightly different, but they're uh, more similar than they are different. So this morning, if you want to build your reputation, if you want to rebuild or work on your character, you can do that. That's one of the reasons why we're here. I hear a lot of brothers say, this is a hospital. I, I want to see the church as a hospital and a gym. You go to the gym to build your strength. Typically, you go to a hospital only when you're sick. But you go to the gym because you want to build yourself. I hope and pray that most of us are here this morning because we want to build ourselves spiritually in some way. You can as we stand and sing the song of invitation. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all, to him I Matthew 10, 32. You must live a life here on earth 
a godly life, a Christian life, an obedient life. You got to know Jesus right here. You can't wait to get to heaven to know him. If you don't know him here, don't expect him to know you there. We've got to do the right thing right here on earth. And then once you confess him that he is the son of, we also need to talk about baptism. Some say baptism is not essential. The Bible says, Acts 2.38, that if you want to receive the remission of sin, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit, and you want to be in Christ, you got to get baptized in the watery grave of baptism. Not poured, not sprinkled, but completely submerged under the water. And then you go down as an old creature, and you will come up as a new creature, but it's not over there. Why you say that? Well, Revelation 2.10 said you must remain faithful unto death. It's like getting married. You know, you get married, anybody can get married, but can you stay faithful unto death? So those are, the, those are the six steps that will put you in Christ, and you can become a member of the Church of Christ. Let me tell you, there's no other way to do it other than what I just said. If you read your Bible, if you rightly divide the Word, you'll find out there's only one way. And Jesus said, uh, John 14 to 6, I am the way, the truth. So you want to do it God's way and not man's way. And you'll always come out smelling good. It's in my vein, Lord. In my vein, yes. It's in my vein, now.